Uh, thank you, Tom. That was incredibly generous, and um, I hope I can get a copy from you before I leave. Um, <coughs> I, um, I don't know if any of you have had the pleasure of being a parent to teenage boys. Uh, if so, uh, you may have seen a movie called Wayne's World, where there's a refrain of the Wayne and Garth saying, not worthy, not worthy, not worthy. Uh, so I feel a little bit that way. I, I started out my career many, many years ago thinking I'm a reporter um, with a kind of a literary bent. and. Somehow, for reasons I don't completely understand, I got pulled into the social science world. Many of you in this room have helped me along the way with various of the projects that Tom mentioned and others. Um, and I want to particularly mention um, Ken Pruitt, who in the years since I've been at Columbia University has been a, a real mentor to me in understanding kind of the deep structure of social science and helping me understand how to teach that to uh, journalists in training. Um, but back to this. Um, this is an audience with some historians in the room, but, but a minority. So not all of you may know the name uh, Patricia Nelson Limerick. She is the unofficial dean of the School of Non-Triumphalist History of the American West. And in addition, she has an excellent sense of humor. She likes to talk about Mr. T, meaning Frederick Jackson Turner, the originator of the much discredited frontier thesis of American history. By the way, uh, those interested in impact of social science, this is a person who's totally discredited over and over and over theory uh, was specifically referenced by Franklin Roosevelt and John F. Kennedy in laying out what they intended to do as President of the United States, <laughs> for better or for worse. Um, by giving him the nickname of a character on a cheesy 1970s TV show that some of you may remember if you weren't working on your dissertation so diligently, um, she is displaying a de degree of irreverence toward a scholar who for a long time was considered an unimpeachable giant but also acknowledging that he is ubiquitous and unavoidable in her field. In Patty's spirit, I think of Walter Lippmann as Mr. L. I'm not a wholehearted admirer of his, mainly because of his profound skepticism about democracy and about the press, but he simply cannot be dismissed. Most journalists necessarily work in the moment, Lippmann is one of the very few who produced works that bear reading long after they were published, especially the books he wrote during the early decades of his career. Most members of the small cohort of journalists who have produced work of lasting value wrote descriptively about events they witnessed or reported on. Lippmann belongs in an even smaller sub-cohort of journalists who wrote political analysis or public philosophy that has lasted. The book of, of Lippmann's that we journalists love the best is Liberty in the News from 1919, which gives us a heroic role in society. But only three years later, in public opinion, Lippmann was despairing about journalism. Trapped by commercial imperatives, habituated to understanding the world merely as a series of events, unable to devote steady attention to matters of substantive importance, the press, he concluded, could not function as the mainspring of an intelligent democracy. I'm quoting him now. At its best, the press is a servant and guardian of institutions. At its worst, it is a means by which a few exploit social disorganization to their own ends. That was written, I would remind you, 97 years ago. That the Academy honors Lippmann's memory with a fellowship and admits me as a member may demonstrate a greater faith in journalism than Lippmann himself had. That's gratifying. It's worth using this occasion to take just a moment to think about what journalists do, or at least can, 
contribute, especially by the lights of this august company. More, many of my social scientist friends think of journalists as communicators, people who help frame and shape public discourse and who, at least on our good days, can make expert knowledge accessible to a wide audience. In particular, their definition of an outstanding journalist would be one who writes about social science research regularly and accurately. But we journalists usually think of ourselves differently, differently as, although we would not use this term in our internal circles, social science researchers. We give our highest esteem to colleagues who generate new information rather than passing along information others generated. Most of us are ethnographers, and there are some aspects of ethnography, such as the study of incumbent public officials, that may be easier for us than they are for our academic colleagues. Because we do not live inside the academic disciplinary structures, we can make connections between fields that at universities are usually studied separately. Because our work is aimed at the public rather than at professional colleagues, we are trained to make technical topics lively and compelling. All this would add up to our making a contribution to social science that is greater than mere transmission of scholars' findings. My attitude toward Mr. L is about as complicated as Patty Limerick's is about Mr. T. I reread him regularly with admiration for his acuity. More and more with the passing years, I am persuaded that he was right in concluding that an informed general public brought to us by the wonders of journalism and unmediated by institutions cannot on its own make American democracy work. But if journalism can't accomplish this, we journalists can make a significant contribution in our individual and collective work by intelligently and determinedly pursuing the truth about society. I hope you can think of us as your partners in this endeavor. Thank you again.